we just looked at the process at work in the center of a star that's uh, on its what we call main sequence and we said that that's when it's converting hydrogen to helium and each time it does that there's some energy released and that energy is in the form of E equals mc squared where E is the energy, m is the mass, and c is the speed of light and we just square it. So let's look at an example. And it's amazing what kind of stuff we can do with just this information and a little bit of a definition here. So let's look at this. We have the star Betelgeuse, uh, and it has a luminosity of 120,000 L with this little circle with a dot in it. I'm going to tell you that that actually means luminosity of the sun. That's normally the symbol that we use for this. So every time we have a little circle with a dot, we mean the sun. Um, so that's what we mean here. And here it should be where L of the sun is the luminosity of the sun. Okay, so there I tell you it. Um, then we look at this and we actually have this value. We know that the luminosity of the sun is 3.9 times 10 to the 26 watts. And then the question is how fast is Betelgeuse losing mass? Now this is actually a fairly complicated uh, question if you don't understand the definitions here. So let's maybe define what luminosity is. Luminosity luminosity, we're going to call it L. And we're going to say, well, maybe I better drag it and move it a little bit down here. So luminosity L, let's define it here. So luminosity L uh, equals energy over time. In other words, luminosity, which is measured in watts, is also measured in joules per second. This could be the sort of units. So maybe I'm going to put in little square brackets here. So luminosity, which is given by L, is actually an energy per unit time. So in this case, it would be in joules per second. So basically the value that we're given, although we're told that it's 120,000 times the luminosity of the sun, the luminosity is just a unit of how much energy is being put out over time. And we're told this. And because we're told this value of the sun, and we know this, then we can actually figure out some stuff here. Now let's take a look at what we know so far then. So just from this, we can say then that, uh, maybe I'll do it in blue, so I'll say so. Now we know that um, well, L is an energy over time, so maybe I'll write as delta E over delta T. That means sort of a change in energy over change in time. We know that equals 120,000 because we're told this, that it's 120,000 times the luminosity of the sun, which is 3.9 times 10 to the 26. And we're going to know that that is measured in joules per second. So maybe we'll need our calculator for this. So I'll take this and I'll clear the history. Here we go. So I'll say then, well, 120,000 times, and I'll put this in brackets maybe just to be absolutely sure I do it right, 3.9, I want times 10 to the, so that's the little EE -E here, times 10 to the power of 26. Close my bracket, press enter. I get a value of 4.68 times 10 to the 31. Now I was only given two significant figures, so I'm going to use that, so I'm going to say 4.7 times 10 to the 31. So that's something I know now. So that means that delta E over delta T is equal to 4.7 times 10 to the, whoops, I forgot already, times 10 to the 31. So times 10 to the power of 31 joules per second. This is something that I know. Now how is this useful to me? Well, I do have this equation, E equals mc squared. But the problem is, I don't have E. I only know delta E over delta T. But I want to know how fast is it losing mass. What I mean by that is I want, you know, how fast is m changing per unit time? I want delta m delta t. So this is what's kind of cool. What you can do here, you can be a bit cheap and say, well, if I divide both equations by delta t, I can arbitrarily do that as long as I do it to both sides. Then take a look at this then. That means then that I have that, you know, delta, uh, delta e. Maybe I'll write it with a delta here. That means delta E over delta T equals delta M over delta T times C squared. That's the important thing here. So delta E over delta T is equal to delta M over delta T times C squared. Now I want delta M over delta T. 
So, delta m over delta t is going to be equal to, well, what do I do algebraically? I just want to get rid of this c squared. I want it on the other side of the equation. And the way to get rid of something that's multiplying this thing is to divide by it. Because if I had c squared divided by c squared, that would get rid of it, right? It would be c squared over c squared, which would be 1. So that means I have delta e over delta t divided by c squared, which is the same thing as saying 1 over c squared. So this is what I need to do. And I already know delta e over delta t. It's this value. So I could say then that delta m over delta t, in other words, how fast the mass changes with time, is equal to 4.7 times 10 to the 31. That's going to be joules per second. Uh, and that's going to be times 1 over, and it's going to be 3 times 10 to the 8 quantity squared. So I can do that on my calculator as well. So I'm going to just say my last answer here. I'm going to say, um, well, divided by brackets. I'm going to say 3 times 10 to the 8. I'm going to close that bracket and square that, just to make sure I got it absolutely correct. And when I do that, I get 5.2 times 10 to the 14. So I could say, therefore, it's 5.2 times 10 to the 14 kilograms per second. That is how fast Betelgeuse is losing mass. That is actually really fast. That is a lot of kilograms every second. In fact, you might be wondering, well, what is it for the sun? Well, for the sun, it would be, well, just, it would be this value just divided by 120,000. So if I actually took this last thing right here and I just divided that, because we were told that the other one was 120,000 times bigger than the sun. So if I just divide by 120,000, I get 4.3 times 10 to the 9. So that would mean, for example, that the sun because this, by the way, this is our answer. We're done here. This is it. This is the answer. Just for fun, the sun is actually 4.3 times 10 to the 9 kilograms per second, which is, you know, that's like 4 billion kilograms every second. This is way more than that, right? This is uh, five orders of magnitude more. In other words, this is 120,000 times more mass lost every second than is this. And the sun loses 4 billion kilograms every single second. That's how much the sun is converting to energy. And a lot of that is in the form of light. So although this uh, example looked really complicated, because, I mean, we did have to work a little bit sneakily with this delta m over delta t idea. But at least uh, and we had to know the definition of luminosity. But if you knew that, then it was actually fairly straightforward. But I think it's good to put numbers in these things. It's good to sort of quantify these things. You don't just have to sort of just look at pictures and say, ooh, that's astronomy, because this is astrophysics. We can do some physics with it and actually calculate stuff. I think that allows us to know a lot more about stars. I think it's more interesting. Now we have something else called hydrostatic equilibrium. And that is really cool. This is actually, this is the constant battle uh, between gravity and we'll call it radiation pressure. So what happens then is this. In a star, so let's say we have some sort of star here. Um, yeah, so we'll say this is the star. There it is. It's got some sort of, you know, that's the star. So in the center of it, we actually have an outwards pressure. Because it's giving off light, we actually call this right here, we have an outwards radiation pressure. That goes outwards. That's pushing outwards. But at the same time, this star has mass, right? So everything, you know, is actually pushing against. So there's this battle between that and gravity, which adds up, you know, that's sort of a gravitational pressure in that case. So that means gravity is always trying to squish everything in, but the radiation of it, in other words, the fact that the star is giving off light, turns out radiation can actually have a pressure. Um, there's actually really cool examples. I've seen an example where someone can actually hold up a penny just by a laser. 
Um, it's a very special type of laser, and it's a very special way, but it is possible. You can actually sort of, light can actually push on stuff. And so light pushes up against gravity. So there's a constant battle between them. So there's a constant inwards, you know, inwards gravity pressure and the outwards radiation pressure. And so we have something that we call a stable star. So um, a stable star, so something that we call stable, um, uh, that is when uh, we are in equilibrium. So a stable star is in hydrostatic, that's what we call it, hydrostatic equilibrium. In other words, the two pressures are equal. Okay, the two pressures are equal. This is really bad writing that I'm doing here. So the two pressures are the same. So what that means then, well we can look at the converse of that. What if it's not in hydrostatic equilibrium? Because by the way our own Sun is, is in hydrostatic equilibrium. It's happy, it's got lots of radiation pressure outwards, it's got lots of gravity inwards, and it's all steady. This is like if you inflate a balloon. What's happening is there is inwards pressure outwards and you have the atmosphere which is giving sort of sorry there is inside the balloon there is pressure going outwards and there is atmospheric pressure which is pushing inwards right it's trying to squish it of course what happens then if you want to blow up a balloon what do you do well you add extra pressure inside and what does that do that pushes out and that makes it expand well, the same thing can happen in a star. If you added radiation pressure, it would sort of expand, whereas if it lost pressure, it would contract. And a lot of what happens inside a star is just explained by this. So what will happen, for example, is when a star runs out of hydrogen to convert to helium. You know, we talked about the process inside a star. Inside the star, it's converting hydrogen to helium and having an outwards pressure. So when it runs out of hydrogen to convert to helium, that means it's not going to be doing this uh, energy outwards, which means there's not going to be as much radiation pressure. But when that happens then, of course, this value right here, this pressure is not as much. Because there's less pressure, gravity is going to win, which means the center of the star is going to contract or collapse. So that means gravity is going to sort of win and squish it. But of course, something interesting happens. When you squish the gas inside a star, then it might actually be hot enough and dense enough to where helium can actually be fused. So stars will do that in uh, different stages, and it depends on the star and how much there is and what its mass is. But basically, it's like a big battle between radiation pressure and gravity. But if a star is happy and stable, then we say it's in hydrostatic equilibrium. That's because the outwards radiation pressure is equal to and opposite to the inwards gravitational pressure.